Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Dwight Hahn, the chair of the Political Science Department, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2014 Wolfold Lecture in Public Policy. This lecture is part of the Political Science Department's annual Wolfold Seminar in Public Policy, which was established in honor of the founder of our department, Father Paul Wolfold. Father Wolfel was a political theorist and an outstanding teacher who encouraged his students to pursue careers in public service for the greater good. And clearly our speaker tonight is in that tradition. Uh, I also want to mention today's lecture is co-sponsored by the Northeast Ohio chapter of the American Constitution Society. I'd like to thank ACS chapter president Mike Moody for assistance from the chapter for publicizing this event. I'd also, uh, of course, like to give a special welcome to the members of the ACS who are here tonight. This evening's lecture, uh, The U.S. Senate in Flux, is being presented by Mr. Jeremy Paris. Uh, and a few words uh, by way of introduction. Uh, he currently is serving as executive director of the Group Plan Commission which is the coordinating body between the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and private sector partners working to invigorate Cleveland's downtown public spaces. Yeah, okay. Nice for us to live downtown someday. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, of direct relevance uh, to his talk tonight, uh, before returning to Cleveland uh, in 2012, Mr. Paris served as senior aide to Senator, Senator Patrick Leahy for uh, eight years. In that role, he served as chief counsel for nominations and oversight. He managed the unit responsible for consideration of nominations to the United States Supreme Court, lower federal courts, and the Department of Justice, uh, including the nominations of, and I just have to read this list, uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, Justice Elena Kagan, Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Samuel Alito, and Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, he was also responsible for advising Chairman Leahy in the Democratic Caucus on strategy for managing nominations through the Senate process. Uh, additionally, he assisted Chairman Leahy in conducting oversight of the Department of Justice and the White House. I guess I'm trying to say this man has inside knowledge. <laughs> um, in addition to that, Mr. Paris is a graduate of Shaker Heights High School. Uh, <laughs> he received his BA in Political Science from Yale University and his JD from Harvard Law. Um, the format for tonight is basically Mr. Paris will speak for uh, 45 to 50 minutes or so. Uh, following that, we'll have 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Um, clearly, Mr. Paris comes qualified to speak to us today on the Senate and the crossroads it now confronts. I give you Mr. Paris. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, can you hear me on the mic? We're, we're trying this out. Perfect. Is that perfect? Okay, great. Uh, this is one of those many moments when I wish I was like my old boss, Senator Pat Leahy, who was, I think, about 6'5", and uh, would have towered over the podium. But I, I'm so honored to be here today uh, to talk to you about the U.S. Senate. And uh, I think it's a credit uh, to you, a uh, credit to John Carroll uh, and the community that so many people have turned out to hear this lecture about uh, the U.S. Senate and the Senate rules and, and how, they, how they affect us all. Uh, you know, Dwight has tried several times to intimidate me uh, in the course of uh, doing this lecture. One, he sent me the list of people who have delivered this lecture in the past. And it is a hard list to live up to, so I'm going to try to do my best. A lot of, a lot of greats from the area, a lot of greats from the country uh, have come here and addressed, addressed this crowd. Second of all, uh, he was clearly very surprised and disappointed I did not come armed with a PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm going to try to hold your attention wrapped in the old school way uh, with words and frantic gestures. Um, so please lock the doors. Um, 
I also, in addition to thanking Dwight, I want to thank Sarah Schiavone, Karen Connell, and the rest of the John Carroll Political Science Department. I've gotten to know a bunch of you today. Uh, uh, really nice to put this event together. I've already had a great day here at John Carroll. I had a chance to sit and talk to the most fantastic set of students at lunch today, uh, and uh, I'm no longer, no longer afraid of the questions I might get here because I think I got all the tough ones there. But uh, people are really excited. It's exciting for me to see people so excited about public service, uh, about the government, about uh, the way our community should work. Uh, you know, and it's, it's funny, uh, my uncle Jimmy just walked in and he is a lifelong Shaker resident and he had the same reaction I did when he came in the door, which is, I've lived in Shaker my whole life and I've never been to John Carroll. And that is true for me too. I feel like the gates have finally opened. I have finally been let in. I, I, I grew up not far from here, uh, hanging out in, in Fairmount Circle where Pizzazz was once our gang and had the world's best arcade, uh, where camp, CBS was once Campus Drug and my parents had a charge account there even though it was not the 1950s, it was the 1980s uh, and we had credit cards. Um, and uh, I did buy a lot of candy on that account. I also want to thank uh, Mike Muti and the American Constitution Society who co-sponsored the event today. Uh, you know, if you don't know about the American Constitution Society, they're a wonderful organization. They promote the vitality of the U.S. Constitution, uh, equality, uh, individual rights, liberty, and equality. A uh, terrific organization, very in the spirit of what I think we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm so happy to see so many friends and family here, and, and I hope not to disappoint. I, I do want to name check one great John Carroll alum who is, who is not here today because he, he's, he's handling something that I, I would have been handling for my, my day job when I'm not addressing it. It's Tony Coyne who is the board chairman of the Group Plan Commission. That's where I'm working now. We're revitalizing Cleveland's great public spaces. Uh, Tony was a John Carroll alum and a political science alum. Uh, and he knew Father Wolfel, but the person he really knew was Kathy Barber, who succeeded Father Wolfel as head of the political science department. And she was, uh, I think, the first woman to head that department, because I guess she was the second person to head that department. Uh, and she had this impressive career where she negotiated the SALT II Treaty, uh, has done wonderful things. They've endowed a student award after her here. And I found out today she also was a critical part of the effort to block the highway from going through Shaker Heights. So for those of us who live around the Shaker Lakes, thank you to Kathy Barber. Um, all right, so, you know, when Dwight first asked me to do this, he said, you know, why don't you come and give a lecture about the Senate rules? And I said, great, that is sure to draw a big crowd, light everyone's hair on fire. Who wouldn't want to hear such a lecture? You can go see my seminar series online about Robert Tools of Order. And, uh, you know, but, you know, it, it strikes me that few things should matter less to people than the arcana of how the Senate operates, how it works. Uh, you know, whether, whether uh, uh, it's conducting its business well or, or not in the sense of how, how its rules work. Uh, you know, and even though I spent the better part of the last decade, as, as I mentioned, working for an absolutely terrific senator, Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, I know this is a hard sell. I mean, people have better questions about the Senate, like, uh, why can't it get its act together? Uh, why can't you fix stuff? And, and those are good questions, but, but if I do my job right today and, and can put this in, in some context, um, you know, I can, I can make you understand why, how the Senate operates, why it's not operating, what we can do about it. It's something you really should care about uh, and something I hope you do care about. Uh, and one other note uh, before we dive right in, uh, you know, and, and this is for all of you comparative uh, uh, political science majors out there. Uh, I did not come up with the term world's greatest deliberative body for the Senate. Uh, it, is, it is often called that. I wasn't doing a comparison of other great deliberative bodies and saying the Senate is the best. Uh, it, it, it's, it has long been called that. Uh, it has long been considered a, a bright spot of, of deliberative thought and of uh, considered action. And the question is, is it still that body? And can it, you know, if it's not, can it be again? Uh, you know, and, and the other thing is, if we understand why things have gone wrong, I think we can together figure out how to chart a, a better path forward. And so I hope we can get to that today too. But let me start first with a story. Uh, my, my wife, Katie, who uh, has taught me a lot about public speaking and, and about how to approach crowds says, a lot better to start with a story than, than with facts and, and figures. So I'm going to do my best. So uh, as I mentioned, I was lucky enough to spend eight years at my, at my dream job. Uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, who is the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, is, is the longest serving member of the U.S. Senate. And, and he really is the kind of senator you imagine you want senators to be. He is a public servant, uh, old school in the best sense, friends across the aisle, uh, does things for the right reasons, cares about the public, uh, he's smart, he's tough, he's fair. And, and I learned a lot, a lot about what I think about the Senate and what I think the Senate can be was really informed uh, by my old boss. And you know, so what do I, I was a staffer and you know, I was asked, I sort of try to 
talk about that a little bit today when we were, we were with students. Like, what, you know, and there are a lot of questions about what, what does a staffer do? Uh, and I'll tell you, there, there are a lot of embarrassing and, and small things that staffers do. Uh, but one of the best things staffers do that, that I got to do was uh, I was the lead staffer for the uh, hearing on the nomination of Sonia Sotomayor to the U.S. Senate. She was, um, if you, first of all, if you've ever watched hearings, the staffers are the guys that as the senators are talking are sitting really stone-faced behind, trying not to react, usually going from the chin down. So I had to buy better ties so that my mother would be proud of me on TV. Um, but uh, so President Obama was elected in 2008, came into office in 2009. Uh, I had worked on previous Supreme Court hearings, uh, but uh, the one uh, for Justice Sotomayor was exciting. She was a historic nominee. She was going to be the first Latina on the Supreme Court. Uh, she had the longest judicial record of anybody who had been uh, nominated to the Supreme Court. Uh, and I, I don't know if it's in history. I, I think it was just in a long time. She'd been nominated by Republican President Ronald Reagan to the District Court, which is the Federal Trial Court. She'd been nominated by Bill Clinton uh, to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. She had served many years, uh, not a controversial background, uh, when she was nominated to the Supreme Court. And uh, among the jobs I had to do was, uh, uh, I was the one of the, uh, not officially, but I was the whip for the committee. Uh, and, and that is a lot less exciting than it sounds. It meant I got to know what I had to figure out who, where the votes were, who was voting for whom, where did that stand? Uh, where, was she going to get a majority on the committee? Uh, was she going to get a bipartisan majority on the committee? And so uh, uh, the key time for that was uh, after four days of hearings, uh, after many months of preparation, we're getting ready for the committee vote. Uh, and by that time, we had learned that uh, though all of the Democrats on the committee were going to support her. Uh, all or almost all of the Republicans were going to oppose her based on some speeches she had given uh, about uh, uh, the, the meaning of, of diversity. Uh, and that was, there, there were some ways in which that was troubling to some of them. And, and ultimately, because the National Rifle Association came out in strong opposition to her nomination. Uh, and you know, so as the senators go around the table, and they each get a chance to give a speech, and you know, first the Democrat speaks, the Republican speaks, and on, on a Supreme Court hearing, they, give, they, give, you know, they, they all speak about it and tell them why, why explain their votes. I knew who what each senator was going to vote, except for Senator Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham is the conservative Republican senator from South Carolina. Uh, you might remember him. He came to prominence. Uh, for those of you who are not currently in college, I guess you probably wouldn't remember this, but he came to uh, prominence as the impeachment manager for the House uh, on the impeachment of President Clinton in the 90s. Uh, he, he came over to the Senate. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's deeply conservative, but in addition, he uh, was an Air Force veteran, a longtime member of the Air Force JAG Corps, uh, which is the military lawyers. Um, he's one of the great iconoclasts of the U.S. Senate. He will speak his mind. Uh, he will not always tout the party line. And we didn't know where he was going uh, to vote when it came around to him. So uh, for me, paying attention to Senator Graham was always important. So in, in announcing his vote, which was his vote in support of Justice Sotomayor, he was the lone Republican on the committee to vote in support of Justice Sotomayor. He said two things, uh, uh, both of which I think are important. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to talk to you, not read that much, but I'm going to have to read this because my memory is only, only so good. Uh, Senator Graham said first, quote, I do not want to set a standard here that people who are aspiring to be a judge will never have a thought, never take on an unpopular cause. It is OK to advocate a position that is different than we would advocate ourselves. Uh, he also said, quote, I find her to be well qualified, I would not have chosen her if I had made this choice as president, but I understand why President Obama did. Elections matter. So he gave two reasons for his support. And I think, they, and we'll talk more about that, but they give a, this says a lot about the courage of, of Senator Lindsey Graham. He, he constantly is in threat of facing a primary challenge in deeply Republican South Carolina. So this vote in favor of her and against what the other Republicans committee was doing was not going to help him personally, politically. Uh, you know, with a Democratic majority in the Senate that had, had reached 60 by that time, we, we knew Justice Sotomayor would be confirmed. Uh, but I have always felt, many of us felt, it was important for the country that it be a bipartisan vote. Uh, it is important for what that says. The Supreme Court is, is reposed with enormous, enormous power and authority. They are appointed for a lifetime. It is much better for the country when there can be bipartisan support, uh, for, especially for a kind of nominee like Justice Sotomayor. It also said a lot about the then current Senate, that, that he was the only one. But most of all, it speaks to the importance of understanding the roles of each of the branches of government and the need for those in office to respect the limits of each actor in the constitutional system of checks and balances. That is, to me, what Senator Graham showed with his moment of courage. 
So, you know, senators putting the interests of the country ahead of their own personal interests, which, which is, I, I think, what Senator Graham did there, uh, it's not just a nice story to tell. Uh, it, I mean, it's a great story to tell. It all makes us feel good. But it's a lot more than that. It is actually at the very heart of why the Senate has worked in the past, maybe why the government has worked in the past, and why it is struggling to work now. Um, so here is where I'm going to... Yeah, more people showing up. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Sound the alarm. No. Um, uh, you know, I, this, is, this is where I want to prepare you for my very technical legal analysis of the Senate rules. This is the part where uh, Dwight got me very excited to talk about this to a big crowd, and I want to apologize in advance because it's highly technical. In a nutshell, the Senate rules are rules for grown-ups. That's it. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> right. Thank you. It was supposed to sound really technical and said it's really earthy. Right. So you're supposed to laugh. Uh, the, the Senate rules are rules for grown-ups. Uh, you know, so let's go back to Senator Graham. What, what did he do in that moment? You know, he acted like someone who understood the power of the election and the power uh, uh, that that conferred, that the president would get to nominate a person that he would select to be on the Supreme Court. Uh, he acted like someone who understood that a nominee might not always agree with him, but that didn't make them a bad nominee. That is something that senators from both parties have uh, over, over time, uh, had many people that exhibited. Senator Leahy uh, voted for the nomination of, of John Roberts when President Bush nominated him. He, he was confirmed, I think, about 80 to 20. Uh, and it was a lot of that same. They didn't vote for him because they thought they'd agree with him. They voted for him because they thought he was super well qualified to be on the Supreme Court, very smart, very gifted. Uh, and, but most of all, Senator Graham acted like a grown-up. He acted like somebody I think we, we think we'd all react in that situation. Uh, you know, so why does this matter? Like, what, what, why does it matter that the rules are rules for grown-ups? They're not the easy rules, the playground rules. The playground rules are majority wins. There are five of us, what three of us want goes. That's, that's fair. It, it may even be just. It's certainly easy. So these aren't those rules. Why does it matter? Uh, first thing, you've got to understand how the Senate operates. Let's start there. Everything works and only works in the Senate by what is called unanimous consent that any senator has the power to object to almost anything, and in so doing, stop that from happening totally. Uh, am I killing you with the camera by wandering around? Yeah. All right, all right, thanks. Sorry, I just realized I don't want to be that jerk uh, uh, who's in and out of the frame. Um, so that gives a lot of power to each senator, uh, and you, know, you want them to not take that to the nth degree and abuse it at every cycle. You know, we, we are in a, you're gonna hear terms when I talk and maybe some of you ask about filibusters, uh, about cloture, which is the vote required to end a filibuster, uh, and, and about all these sort of complicated parts of Senate procedure. And as I thought about this and really did think about how to address some of how working there, I knew some of these ins and outs, how it worked, it really boiled down to me to one central principle, uh, which is that the only way the Senate works is by unanimous consent. That is the only way to move anything forward, and anybody can stop that at any time. So uh, let's walk through it for a moment. How, how does that work in practice? Uh, why does that matter? Well, you know, most of the Senate day, you could have a vote. You, you ask unanimous consent uh, to recess for the day. You ask unanimous consent to move to an amendment or a vote on some matter, no matter how small. You ask for unanimous consent to move to a resolution in honor of a post office. I mean, those kind of things. Uh, you have to ask unanimous consent to suspend the owner's requirement that a bill be read three times. A bill, read, I mean, these bills can be long, so you, this poor clerk up there reading, straining their voice, and you're going nowhere. The Senate's going nowhere. Nobody's going, you don't do any other business. And all because one senator objects, and it's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, the only mechanism to overcome that objection is what we talked about, it's cloture. Cloture vote is the vote to end debate and move to a vote. And through most of the Senate's history, though not all, and it's not in the Constitution, and it wasn't there at the start, uh, you have a vote by a supermajority of the senators to end debate, uh, and then you move on. Uh, this takes a long time. This takes a long time, because there are all these other rules about 30 hours of post-cloture debate. Uh, it takes everybody and everybody to the floor to do something that could be done with the snap of a finger. And so that's the only way the Senate's ever worked. And what that means is the norms and practice of the Senate, as opposed to the rules of the Senate, are really what is important. It's really important to have people there that understand, let's not take this to the nth degree. You know, I may not agree with this nominee. I may vote against this nominee. I don't like the president who nominated this nominee. But I am not going to stand in the way of the nominee getting a vote. A majority will win 
minority will lose, and we move on. That's true for legislation. That's true for any number of things. And so why in the past were there fewer filibusters, more getting along? Was it that these were good people? Was it, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, if you know history, I mean, these are some terrible people. I mean, people would beat each other up on the floor. I mean, these are, you know, people supporting slavery. I mean, these are not always good people, but there were always pressures, and uh, uh, there, there's hard pressure, there's soft pressure. Uh, you know, the leaders have to assert control over this whole process. Uh, do you want that committee assignment? Well, you're going to support me moving this to a vote. Do you want me to support the thing you care about, your vote? Well, you better support mine. Uh, if you want to get out on the weekend and go home for recess so you can talk to your constituents, well, we're going to be here all week. I got, all, I got nowhere to go. I'm not in cycle. You know, I'm not up for election, so I'll stay here all weekend. You, you know. um, and so those kind of pressures uh, are easy to push. So you know, there's a way out of this with a rules change. That rules change is adopt the rules of the House of Representatives. Adopt that playground rules, that majority rules, boom. Majority wins, we're done, we're out. All this nonsense of one senator saying, you know what, I don't want to pay uh, for our debt, and I'm going to stand on the floor and shout about it and not allow a vote and screw up everybody's Christmas. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. We, we could adopt rules that are majority wins. The House certainly operates more smoothly than the Senate. Uh, but let me tell you why I, I think that's not the right course, why I hope there's a better course. It's because the rules of the Senate, which require comedy, common sense, and common purpose are rules that are really reflective of the values of our Constitution. So um, I did bring a copy of the Constitution with me just to prove uh, it's not long. It's not long. Uh, you can reduce it to a very small uh, gilded book. I brought it here in case we had to refer to the grand document. But uh, I, I, I doubt that we will, but it's always good to have. I learned that trick from, from senators. It's a really great prop to wave around. Uh, and after today's McCutcheon uh, case, which we'll talk about a little later, I thought about wrapping it in a $10 bill and waving it around, because I think that's where we're going. Um, so uh, that's a good inside joke for those of you who care about campaign finance reform, or what used to be campaign finance reform. Uh, we will talk about it later. We'll clue you all in on the joke. It's great. Uh, the Constitution is a majestic document in my view. The Constitution starts in the name of we the people. It formed a government that has been flexible enough to serve us for more than 225 years. It's an aspirational document. It, it was dedicated the young nation to the ideal of forming a more perfect union. That set in motion a project that has been the project of the generations of making the Constitution better, making the country better. Uh, the Constitution has certainly been uh, uh, through the bloody crucible of the Civil War, it was tested, uh, but it is endured, it was not broken. It was once a protection for a small group of slave-owning landowners, and it's now gone on to become the bulwark of freedom, serving the basis of Brown v. Board of Education, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, it, it has been a part of our path of an inclusive democracy. Uh, the genius of our Constitution is it is not just rules on a chalkboard. It's not a narrow set of prescriptive rules that uh, 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 you know, would have been rendered obsolete long ago. Uh, it's an enunciation of principles. Uh, if you read the Constitution, you'll understand it is full of overlapping and sometimes contrasting authorities, checks, balances, all these good terms that you either are studying now or did study long ago or should study probably soon. Uh, it's because you got to take part. That's going to be the big lesson here. This is hard stuff, and if you're not doing your part, you really don't have a right to complain. We're all going down the tubes. Um, so so there, this is going to end with an exhortation to care. And so if I really failed at this lecture, you won't care, and then that's, that's on me. But if it's a good lecture, you got to care. Um, you know, it, it really strikes me that this constitution that worked for a tiny agrarian, coastal, puny country works for what became the world's lone superpower. And it, you know, the improvement that was the project of the generations is something that really, to me, you know, sort of sings as, as about the genius of the Constitution. It started with the Bill of Rights, with the eradication of America's original sin of slavery, uh, with the 14th Amendment that provided equal protection of law to all Americans, the 19th Amendment that didn't grant women the right to vote until 1920. So I guess we had some improving to do. Uh, and the growing inclusiveness of American democracy in this last century that may now be under threat from, from 
we won't talk about it today, but from, if you ask me questions, I will, uh, about real threats to our right to vote. These, you know, and, and one more thing about the, the Constitution, you know, it, it's also an optimistic document. It's imperfect, but it's optimistic. It's like our country. Uh, but its strengths, which are this flexibility, uh, provide challenges. It's not easy. It is not a set of rules. You can't say, huh, so we passed this law. Let's go check and see if it's constitutional and line it up against some set of laws in the Constitution and say, oh, yeah, here, it X marks the spot. It, 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 in some places, it's very narrow and prescriptive. There, there are rules about how you count people and all these things, which also are problematic and now out of vogue, uh, thank God. Uh, in other spots, it is vague and general. I said separation of powers, uh, overlapping authorities. Some powers are enumerated specifically. Some are just implied. Implied. And you know what? There's still powers. Uh, here's the thing. Even the founders didn't agree about what it means. Uh, the original political parties, which were every bit as, as, as fierce uh, as they are today, I mean, these were people who really, truly believed the other side was a totally betraying the founding, was betraying America, were traitors. These were the people who wrote the thing. They, they started it. They, you know, Jefferson was in France, sure, but everybody else was there. They were there and they formed political parties. To support ratification, uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and John Jay uh, wrote the brilliant Federalist Papers. They explained, they defended their creation. Uh, these are, are really great to read. They also don't all agree, so first of all, don't expect that to be easy. Uh, but only a decade later, these would be the greatest political foes fighting over the meaning of the Constitution they had defended only years earlier. So if they couldn't agree, how are we supposed to do it? How could we? Let me give you just a few examples, uh, just so you didn't think, as I said, this is going to be hard. A, a, a few examples of some of these gloriously, hopelessly vague principles in places in the Constitution that are seriously important. This is for you, ACS people. Um, Article 1, Section 8, the General Welfare Clause of the Constitution. This is one of the most important clauses. It is part of the enumerated powers given to the U.S. Congress. It says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, excises, to pay debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So what comprises general welfare? That's pretty broad. That's pretty broad. Uh, for what it's worth, this is the clause under which Chief Justice John Roberts very narrowly upheld the Affordable Care Act. He upheld Obamacare. Four of the justices would have struck it down. They said this is not a proper use of the general welfare clause. Here's another one. Uh, uh, probably uh, uh, the basis for, for more laws that have been passed by Congress than any other, the Interstate Commerce Clause, uh, also found Article 1, Section 8, really good article, really good section. Uh, it says, the Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. To regulate commerce. So what, con what constitutes commerce? What constitutes regulating? Whole areas of law have formed around this really simple little clause and what it means. Uh, so one of the most famous cases interpreting this clause was Wickard v. Filburn, in which the court upheld that the growing of wheat by a farmer for use on his own farm was subject to regulation by Congress because by producing his own wheat, he would buy less wheat from other people. So it affected commerce. Uh, it doesn't get much broader than that. That's really broad. That's everything. More recently, a case called Gonzalez v. Raich, this is a fun one, 2005, the court upheld a law criminalizing the production and use of homegrown marijuana, uh, even where the states approve its use for medicinal purposes because it would have a substantial effect on the interstate market for marijuana, an illegal substance. <laughs> so the, the, the test was formed, substantial impact on interstate commerce. What does that mean? Well. One would think, and this is you know, where I'm going to try not to come across like a wild-eyed liberal, but I did, I'll just, full disclosure, I supported Obamacare. I know many of you oppose it. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this example. Uh, what matters is uh, the Affordable Care Act comprises one-sixth of the entire U.S. economy. Yet five of the giant justices said this didn't count as regulation of interstate commerce. So that's not to say I have the answer to that question at all, but wow, hard, hard stuff. Uh, the list could go on and on. Uh, people here and elsewhere teach whole courses on this kind of stuff. Um, but what we see in these cases is where uh, uh, 
where the language is ambiguous and the meaning of clauses is revealed over time. And it often changes, but it's revealed over time as they're applied by Congress, they're in laws that they pass, uh, by the president and how they interpret laws as they execute, as they, they enforce them, most typically defined by the courts exercising their role of judicial review, uh, a role also not clearly spelled out in the Constitution. But courts, by our 200 years of tradition and law, have the final say on this is constitutional, this isn't, uh, until somebody amends the Constitution again. This process of revealing meaning, creating tests, uh, even where the court seeks to construct bright line rules, is really a reflection of the competing and balancing interests in the Constitution of language. So that's all well and good when you have a court to decide that. Now we may fight about that. Uh, uh, the, I'm gonna talk later about today's decision in McCutcheon v. FEC, which is a very important Supreme Court case handed down only hours ago, uh, with which I'll, I'll preview to the end, I totally and completely disagree with. Tough luck, law of the land, court said so. But what happens when the different constitutional responsibility stories are in tension but the only ones who get to decide are the people who are having the fight in the Senate. What happens when the people having the fight have to decide the fight? That's where it gets fun. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm not doing the George Bush thing where he was asked a question during a de debate and looked at his watch instantly. I'm actually trying to keep track of the time so I can be respectful because I really do want to get to, to questions and answers. Uh, I think that's a lot more fun uh, than, than maybe just listening to me talk. Um, so one of the things I worked on, I was the head of the nomination, the Judicial Nominations Unit in the, uh, in the U.S. Senate. I managed that unit for, for Chairman Leahy for several years. Judicial nominations is the place where senators go to have a fun fight. It's, it's the place where all of those tension points really come. So let's go back to the Constitution for a second. Uh, the lifetime appointment of federal judges and justices is defined, spelled out, Article 2. Article two is the part that gives enumerated powers to the President of the United States. It says, quote, he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. So that's clear on one hand. It's not a hard formula. President nominates, Senate offers advice and consent, and then you get an appointment. Uh, in practice, of course, it hasn't been that easy. This is so interesting to me, uh, maybe it'll be interesting to you, because uh, how advice and consent operates uh, requires constitutional balance. It is a place that all three branches come together. President nominates, Senate confirms or doesn't confirm to staff the third branch of government, make sure we have a functioning judiciary. That interrelationship of the three branches uh, is incredibly important. Uh, you know, judges serve for life. They're, they're, they're there far longer than the presidents that uh, nominate them often far longer than the senators that vote on them. Uh, and the elections really matter because the, the election decides the president who then, and, and, the, and the composition of the Senate who then, we'll, we'll see what the judiciary looks like for many years. Many years, far, I mean we, you know, the decision today in McCutcheon, uh, the decision last year, or two years ago now, uh, to severely limit the Voting Rights Act uh, were the product of a judiciary largely supported by Republican presidents over time, even though the decisions occurred at a time when we'd had a Democratic president for several years and a democratically controlled Senate. This is that fun tension, and, and, and it's, it's intentional. It's intentional that we have multiple and overlapping sources of power. But, so, you know, of course there have been fights by the parties for many years over judicial nominations, it, it, because they're so important. Um, you know, who, what's the right test to, when, when you're evaluating a nominee? What litmus test do you use? What's an appropriate question, an inappropriate question? What makes a qualified nominee? Uh, you know, but the disputes have gone on for so long that it can seem like the Hatfields versus McCoys. If you follow this, it's like the world's oldest blood feud. And it, it feels like both sides are pointing to the other for the original sin. Was it, was it the 60 nominees to President Clinton's that never got a hearing in a Republican-controlled Senate? Was it the half dozen of President Bush's nominees that they Republicans felt were unfairly filibustered uh, in, in the Senate in, in the last decade? Um, you know, you know, almost enough already. We know everybody did bad stuff. Uh, I often think like when when the Senate changes hands, we should have an exchange of of the talking points because each side will be fighting the the other side, and you you can really get turned around if you've been in the Senate long enough. Um, but each time we reach this tension point. Uh, it, there's been a political resolution of the problem that has allowed the path to move forward. A political settlement that tweaks the process and, and lets it move forward. 
And, and, and you know, we're, we're in a time where, where the, clearly there has been a slowdown in nominations. We, we've had about 10% of the federal judiciary vacant for a long time, uh, for many years. Usually the, the nominations spike when a new president comes in, and, and then they go down as, as the pipeline gets filled with judicial nominees. That happened with President Clinton, it happened with President Bush, it hasn't happened with President Obama. It went up and it, and it stayed up. And you know, why should you care? I mean, I mean there's some part of us, and this, you know, it's funny, I, this was my job for years and I struggled with this. How do I make people care about this issue? Is it some imaginary scorecard? You're right, I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong. I mean, you know, it's, why should you care? Well, <laughs> everybody uh, uh, needs timely titles. Plaintiffs, defendants, big corporations, um, uh, people who have been victims of discrimination need a quick resolution of their legal claims. When we don't have enough judges, that process slows down. Um, the, the delays, uh, the vacancies have an effect. And, and you know, when you break it down, one of the key notions that we all, I think, think about America is that you get your day in court. You get your day in court. Well, that, that's getting harder and harder. Um, so what happened with the Senate rules? And, and Dwight, I'm really coming down to answering your question of what happened uh, to the Senate rules. So. The, the short answer is there was a big fight over the D.C. Circuit. The D.C. Circuit is often called the second most powerful court in the land after the Supreme Court. It is a federal appeals court that has an unusual jurisdiction over, um, over agency decisions, administrative law cases, a lot of terrorism cases with a national reach to its decisions. Uh, many of the judges on the D.C. Circuit have gone on to become Supreme Court justices. Uh, it, it clearly matters. Um, the, the blood feud over courts has found no better battlefield than over the D.C. Circuit. Uh, Elena Kagan, now on the U.S. Supreme Court, was once a D.C. Circuit nominee who never got a hearing. Uh, it was ironic when she came up that people complained, well, you've never been a judge. How could you be on the Supreme Court? Well, I was too busy being dean of Harvard and solicitor general of the United States because you wouldn't let me be a judge. Um, so I guess, I guess it worked out for, for Justice Kagan. Um, you know, Democrats fought very hard against uh, President Bush's nominees um, and, and filibustered several of them, filibustered one successfully, uh, and many Republicans felt was, who was extremely qualified. Uh, this is something that really ha had struck a nerve. Um, but at the end, there was, a, there was a huge blow up, there was a political fight, but at the end, there was a path forward. And ultimately, four of President Bush's nominees to that court were confirmed, filling the, the ninth seat on the court, 10th seat, 11th seat on that court. Only one of President Obama's nominees to that court has been confirmed, and the, the last four have been filibustered, and the last three were in a fight of a different character, at least it seems so to the people in the U.S. Senate. The old fights were all about the specific nominees. This nominee is too liberal. This nominee is the wrong position. We're going we're gonna to use our power of advice and consent to stop this nominee. Or, or this nominee is too conservative, their views are outside the mainstream, we're gonna, we can't envision them being on this court making these decisions. Well, this fight was different because in this fight, uh, uh, the Republicans in the Senate said uh, they want to stop President Obama from appointing anybody to that court, full stop. No more nominees to the D.C. Circuit. They said there don't need to be enough judges, there are plenty of judges on the court. Um, there, there are a lot of reasons why they might not have wanted uh, Democratic appointees on that court given that some of the things that the court would be deciding. Uh, but you know, they shut down the process entirely. And, uh, you know, I understand the impulse. Um, I really do. Uh, and I, I'm not trying to paint some party in a bad light and the other party in a good light. I, I understand the impulse in the fight. The problem is that here there was not a political settlement. Um, the system has stopped short in the past of the kind of constitutional crisis that we faced. You know, I can't type the word either. And given my job, that's actually been really hard, a lot of spell check. But uh, the, the yeah, you know, the constitutional crisis not only threatened the ability of the D.C. Circuit to function, it, it threatened the ability of the president to do his constitutional responsibility. This is one of those places the Constitution is hard. You have tricky questions of tension between different parts of the Constitution. The president has to uh, execute the law. The president has to see to it that the third branch has enough judges to do his job. The Senate has the power of vice and consent. Both of those powers are important. Both those powers were in tension. Uh, in the end, the majority leader, Harry Reid, uh, changed the rules to end the supermajority requirement uh, for filibusters of judicial nominees. It, it, this is that, uh, and this is the part that does get technical. He lowered the number of senators needed to end debate, move to a vote on a nominee from 60 to 51 to a bare majority. Um, that meant that in, in, the, in the instant fight there, those three nominees to the D.C. Circuit were confirmed. The filibusters ended, they got voted on there now on the D.C. Circuit. You know, my reaction to that was, was basically resigned sadness. Uh, you know, I did want those nominees confirmed. I had left the Senate by the time this happened, but I hated that it was necessary. You know, we spent years 
years trying to keep the process moving forward in a productive way despite enormous provocation on, on both sides. Uh, and it felt like that time had come to an end. You know, and, and it didn't solve all the problems. You know, what we're seeing is the use of all those other rules that unanimous consent I was talking about. We're seeing that used to gum up the works maybe even worse than before uh, to make it harder at every step to move nominees forward. So it may have solved that initial problem. I, I don't think it solved the real problem. And th this is why I say we need rules for grown-ups. Uh, there are real limits to change in, in what you can do with tweaks to the Senate rules unless the Senate returns to normal. I mean, short of... House rules, House of Representatives rules, majority rules. You can do away with all the rules of assent, do away with the unanimous consent piece, and, and just, just, just make it that clean and up or down. Short of that, I think you've got to go really appeal to people's better nature. The, you know, and, and I think looking at the clock, uh, I could go on about the Senate rules, but I think we'll move on to, this is the part I call threats to constitutional balance. Like, what are, are the threats? Why does it matter that the Senate maybe you know, past the point where those political settlements come out to save us from those constitutional crises. Well, uh, the most obvious effect of partisan gridlock has been the regular use of the filibuster um, to basically make it be a, a de facto 60 vote requirement to do anything in the, in the US Senate. The, the result has been that this Congress and the last have been among the least productive in US history. Um, at least in recent US history. Um, we've all heard about the do nothing Congress, was it Harry Truman, 1940s? Am I right? Okay, anyway, this is like the worst since then. The scorecard's pretty bad. Far fewer laws have passed, far fewer things get done. You know, there, there are so many pressing issues. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna read you a few. Immigration reform, the need to address climate change, reform of the tax code, protection of voting rights, extension of unemployment benefits, um, uh, the need to examine the broad surveillance powers being exercised by the National Security Agency, the need to modernize our armed forces, there seems to be no hope of getting anything done on these big questions. You know, we reached a time when an 11th hour deal uh, to avoid a disastrous government shutdown just to punt the, the dispute a couple months uh, down the road has been hailed as a moment of supreme statesmanship and bipartisanship. I, I guess the bar on statesmanship has become pretty low. Uh, now, a lot of you in this room, certainly many around the country would disagree, would probably look at that list of laws and, and issues I list and say, phew, good we didn't act. Could we act? That sounds terrible. Why would we act? Uh, why would we do that? Uh, and, and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we, we really may have strong disputes, and that's fine. But the damage done uh, far outweighs, by this kind of brinksmanship, far outweighs any particular policy or law. It, to me, it threatens our ability to govern ourselves. Uh, you know, the, since the time of the founding, the Senate has, has acted. Oh my God, the Constitution's on the ground. It's like the Torah. I've got to pick it up and kiss it. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that's that's a good joke to say here at John Carroll University. <laughs> I guess it's good. Good we got the uh, my family in the ACS crowd in, in this. Uh, I, you know, the, the Senate has a body there. The members are elected for six years, not two like in the House, uh, not four like the President. Uh, they're not all reelected in one moment. They are reelected only a third at a time. This means that. Why you get unusual times, like you might have a Democratic president, wildly, massively elected, but have a, a Republican Senate. It, it, it is less um, electorally responsive than the House. Uh, it has buffered it, I believe, from the same kind of partisanship. And it has ensured a government that has tended to be more stable, more enduring, uh, and less zigzaggy than other nations. Uh, and, you know, that has informed how the Senate rules have worked, that notion of stability and of buffering. Uh, you know, since the time of the Civil War, uh, which, which really was uh, uh, what many people, including me, consider a second founding of the nation, we, we were, we're really, really were significant changes in the relationship between our government and our people. But since that time, we faced so many things. And again, I'm gonna do a, a quick list. Industrial age, revolution, transportation, communication, world wars, the Great Depression, uh, Civil Rights Era, Cold War, Vietnam, Watergate, 9-11. Massive changes in our social fabric and our geopolitical standing. Uh, and yet, although we have seen some big shifts, we saw the New Deal, we saw the Great Society, we saw Reaganomics, uh, we've never really flirted with socialism or fascism, uh, and we really have maintained our belief in the power of capitalism and democracy. There has been a real stability, 
at a time when many European nations, we saw what happened in World War II, we saw what happened in the Cold War. The, so, the, the solution, the answer, at a time of world economic crisis was to go extreme and go away from the norms of democracy and capitalism. We didn't do that. So a critical feature of our government, I would argue, I am arguing, I guess, not I would argue, uh, has been its stability and its flexibility. What happens if that's under threat? Where are we, what happens? So why now? Why now is the, is the first question I want to answer, and, and we are only moments away from the Q&A section. Um, why now? You know, there's not one answer. Um, there have been some significant long-term trends that, that have led the Senate and, and the Congress to be very different than it once was. The first is the increasing polarization of the political parties. You know, for a lot of historical reasons, or the, the way the Democratic Party and the way the Republican Party were born, uh, one uh, uh, was a bastion, uh, the Democratic Party uh, was, was a, came out of the support of slavery in the South. The Republican Party was a party of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and that changed over time, but very slowly. And so you, until uh, a, a, two, a generation or two ago, you saw Northern liberal Republicans, Southern conservative Democrats, uh, but those coalitions came apart. The, the New Deal coalition came apart, and what you've had is parties that are increasingly all one or all the other. More liberal Democrats, more conservative Republicans. You also have regional hegemony among parties. The, the Northeast is more Democratic, the South is more Republican. What that means is an individual senator might have, you know, who once had competing pressures, their home state pressures. Are you a, a farm state? Are you an industrial state? Are you both? Are you on the water? Uh, you know, what, what are the issues pressing your state? You'd have ideological issues. Are you conservative? Are you liberal? Uh, you'd have party issues. And all those things would pull on you and, you know, I mean there were tensions going different ways. There was an incentive to cross party action, to finding natural allies. Uh, and it, that has been reduced. That has been reduced. Uh, the, the incentives have gone away from extremism. Now all the polls on the polls. It's away. It's not together. Those are the strongest forces. The, when those incentives and awards all pull the, say, the, the, the act one way, uh, you have trouble. We, we actually talked about this today. It's something I hadn't, you know, hadn't really focused on in, in the class we, we had. Um, you, peop, you know, one of the, the success stories and the counter stories has been the success of women in the U.S. Senate. Uh, have, have done a, quite a good job of having some successful cross coalitions to get things done in the Senate, which, which have nothing to do with, with their particular ideology, but are some common issues, and it's sort of a path forward. Uh, more of that, I hope. And just a sec. The media environment has changed. You know, uh, long, you know, it's become commonplace to talk about the 24-hour news cycle. Well, that's really passe. I mean, it is now the, the up to the second news cycle. News is tweeted out, it's blogged about, uh, it's commented upon, it's reacted upon before it can be understood or digested. Uh, there's no context. The ability to know uh, instantly has corroded, in my view, the ability to work together. You know, if I uh, disagree with somebody and, and we are leading opposing sides of a fight, what if we have a sidebar conversation outside of the Senate chamber? There's an anteroom, it's public, there's press there, there's people. What if you pull me aside and say, oh, maybe we can work together on so and so issue? Some reporter hears it, they tweet it out. It's up there. Then I'm getting whacked on Fox News or on MSNBC. I'm being taught a traitor to my position, and I will back away quickly uh, before the, the, the media train uh, leaves the station. This kills the incentive for developing ideas, reacting to ideas, and deal making. Uh, the third issue is money. Money. So today, and this is where I said I'd get to today's Supreme Court case. Uh, there was a case a few years ago called Citizens United that many of you have probably heard of, which opened the floodgates to basically unfettered corporate money being spent in elections, though not directly on, on candidates um, by, by the candidates' campaign themselves, but it, it unleashed a flood of money. Uh, the, today, the Supreme Court issued a decision called McCutcheon v. FEC, which got rid of limits uh, on the ability to aggregate donations. It used to be you could give a certain amount to one candidate, a certain amount to another candidate, a certain amount to a third candidate, but there's a total limit that you could give. Uh, the limits were like 48,000, 70, really high limits. This did away with that. Now, that alone will probably affect some set of hundreds of donors that are going to be giving that kind of money. Uh, but it certainly signals that all campaign finance reforms are soon to be wiped off the books. Um, the, the chief, it was a five to four decision, John Roberts writing for the majority, Stephen Breyer writing for the minority, and uh, Roberts' decision cited First Amendment issues, equated the First Amendment with 
the giving of money. Uh, Justice Breyer pointed to the fact that Congress has studied the issue and shown the long effect that of this kind of money and giving would have on a corrosive effect on the political process uh, and that it could and would lead to corruption. And that is what Congress considered. Chief Justice Roberts disagreed. He said, I don't see the connection and, and did away with that law. So we certainly, this is here to stay. We're gonna have a lot of money in politics, money that can mask and twist uh, uh, money that the need to raise it, the need to raise it constantly. I mean, I, the figure I'm about to cite has got to be at least 10 years old and totally outdated. That a House member needs to raise $10,000 a day from the time they're elected to get reelected. I mean, it's crazy amounts of money. It makes it harder to work cross party. You you cannot turn off the siphon of fundraising if you want to stay elected. Um, so. I want to quote an old Justice Brandeis quote. Many senators quote this at hearings. It's a great quote. He said, quote, sunlight is the best disinfectant. What he meant was transparency will lead to accountability and undue corruption. But what if we are in an era when transparency does not yield accountability or when it's unreliable or when it leads to retribution? Is sunlight still the best disinfectant or does it just make you a better target? That is unfortunately, uh, uh, the era that I think we're in, and I, it is those pressures that I think have led to the undoing of some of the traditional Senate norms and practices that held us together. So, uh, you know, the title of this was uh, uh, The World's Greatest Democracy at a Crossroads. At a Crossroads. So we're at a crossroads. Where, where, do we, where are we and where do we go from here? Um, so at a time of the greatest strife in our nation's history, as Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated, uh, the, the South uh, many of the states of the South had instantly seceded from the Union. He was trying desperately at the time of the inauguration to hold on to Virginia, literally right across the Potomac. I mean, I used to go out to bars in Virginia and be able to walk home to D.C. Uh, it's really close. He was trying desperately to hold on to Virginia, and he ended his first inaugural address with an appeal to his fellow Americans. Here's what he said, quote, We are not friends. We are, wow, see, I'm already in the modern era. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. So first of all, Abraham Lincoln could write a speech. That much is clear. But what is notable about Abraham Lincoln, in my view, our greatest president, is that he understood human nature in a way that few besides Shakespeare ever have. That, that one's for my mom. Uh, he understood that people are not all good or bad. Uh, they contain within them both good and bad, but he had faith that the good could and would even win out. Even in that bloody crucible of the Civil War, he held on to that faith. So looking at our strained political system now, I wonder, have we set up a system that puts our representatives, our senators, our congressmen, our officials in position to be touched by the better angels of their nature? Is that what we are rewarding? So uh, I always cringe when I hear people blame Washington for the problems of Congress. Because uh, not a single senator in Washington was elected by Washington. All right, we, when I lived in Washington, I didn't get, I didn't get a vote. Uh, you know, believe me, I understand the frustration. I was literally faced with it professionally every day. But the senators come from all the 50 states. Uh, but therein lies the solution. All right, the good news is the power is ours. It's ours here in Cleveland. Uh, it's ours here throughout the country. Democracy is hard work. There are no easy answers. Uh, but whatever your ideology or background, we need to find ways to elect people who can reach across for solutions and who don't disdain compromise. And most of all, we need to find people who do not see heroism in tantrums. Uh, Norman Ornstein, who, who delivered the Wolfe Lecture in 1994, uh, you know, he's, he, he's at the Conservative American Enterprise Institute, has written extensively uh, and despairingly about the current dysfunction in government. He, uh, together with Thomas Mann, wrote a great book in 2012 that I tried not to totally rip off for this lecture called, quote, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. So the book offers a very salient critique of where we are. It, it, it offers some good insights in how to improve the system, but it also acknowledges the long slog will require hard work. So here is my, my sort of prescription. Attitude, not ideology, is the problem. Uh, in reality, the differences between our views and in our backgrounds, I think, has probably, in, in many ways, never been more narrow. 
the acceptable scope of debate is far more narrow than it has been at other trying times in our, in our past. And yet, we've seen a doubling down on an attitude uh, when compromise is seen as weakness and purity tests rule the day. Uh, you know, we've seen going away from a notion of shared sacrifice uh, in favor of zero-sum parochialism. It, it, is a, it is disheartening a bit to see a nation that has adored so much in that fantastic journey from its founding, uh, uh, and that journey towards a more perfect union, that has answered the question. That America is this great experiment. No other country has these people from all over the globe joined together, bound to uh, this document, this government, this constitution, that endured a civil war and became better for it, uh, it is disheartening to see us laid low, not by a great tragedy or scarcity, uh, but by the smallest of pettiness, by the inability to take the long view instead of the short. Uh, you know, and I'm not talking about something as simplistic as civility, okay? I, I'm really not. I, it's not. I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not saying let's be nice to each other. You know, every once in a while, the Senate erupts in bipartisanship, and they all choose to sit together at the State of the Union, find a Republican buddy, find a Democratic buddy, sit together. It's nice, sure, but I'm actually talking about the willingness not to be civil, but to put the good of the country ahead of narrow self-interest uh, and scoring political points. More moments like the one, I, the story I told about Lindsey Graham. Certainly it was not in his political interest, but he put the best interest of the country first. Um, you know, let me be clear about what I'm saying, uh, and, and I'm about to wrap up and take questions. I'm not talking about a weak middle ground. I'm not talking about giving up on your values, giving up on your principles, and saying, let's just find some mushy middle. That's just not what I believe. I mean, I've been, in, I've been on political fights. I've fought for legislation. I worked on the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I've worked on, on a number of judicial nominations. I participate in elections. I really care about this stuff. I am not advocating for a squishy middle. Uh, but I am saying this, is, this idea, uh, this attitudinal idea is something that we need to work through and take account of when we choose who we vote for, who we give money for politically, certainly now, uh, who we, how we involve ourselves in campaigns, when we involve ourselves in advocacy, and we involve ourselves in activism. How are we judging our elected officials? So, uh, you know, it's worth starting to borrow the approach that we see at the local level. Uh, you know, I've been really excited. I came back to Cleveland, as, as Dwight mentioned, uh, at the end of 2012. I'm working for a wonderful nonprofit called the Group Plan Commission. We are trying to revitalize Cleveland's downtown public spaces, redoing Public Square, the downtown mall, building a, a bridge to the lakefront. We're going to make downtown great. And I'm working with this broad set of civic leaders. And I have no idea whether I agree with them politically or not. The nice thing is, that sort of notion of partisanship stops at the city's edge. We may have different ideas about details, but uh, we all want Cleveland to improve. And I think people have the ability to judge those things at the local level. Is it safe? Is my street safe? Are the potholes fixed? Are my services? I live in Shaker. It's great to pick up my garbage behind my house. I'm willing to pay for that. Um, that makes a lot of sense. But are we rewarding those same kind of solution-seeking behavior at the national level? And, and this is the final point. Uh, I've talked about the notion that democracy is hard work. It requires attention. It requires long-term thinking. Sometimes, though not always, triumphing over short-term gains. You know, and I have great faith in Americans as friends, neighbors, community members, um, family. But, you know, but what has been missing is exporting that sort of notion of community and those values and that attitude to the national government. Uh, you know, and, and the national government, in my view, is not a them. It is not a them. It is not an other. It's actually an us. It's actually the people we choose to send there and, and to do our will. So the question I have, and I'll have this for you, uh, and I have it for me, is not what should they do, but what should we do? And that's, I think we have the power to make things better. So that is, uh, at the end of my lecture, I'd love to take your questions. Or did I answer every question? We agree that Jeremy will answer or field the questions himself. I can do this Phil Donahue style if we want and, and race up. Question. Yes. Ted Wheeler said Saturday in D.C. that there is no judicial vacancy crisis or issue because the numbers in this administration are essentially the same as the numbers were in the Bush administration. Assuming you disagree, what would you say? Well, you know, and I, I did look at the numbers coming in, and the, the problem with that is that the vacancy rate has actually grown a lot. Uh, at, the, at this point uh, in, in the Bush administration, the vacancy rate was somewhere around 5%. It's now 10%. 
Um, that's a lot of judges not to have. And at a time when the caseload need is growing and you have a number of senior judges that are 80 and 90 years old barely keeping the system afloat, uh, I know, I feel the same way. Uh, uh, the, you know, you have a, a real problem with how are we going to continue to administer justice. And I, I look, and I have always looked at the vacancy rate and said, how do we bring this down? The, the Judicial Conference is actually calling for more judges and additional judges. So we're, we're actually at a much greater deficit. Uh, that, that's not to justify where, where all things were in the past, but there are certainly something, there's also something we can do something about right now. There are 30 or 40 nominees in the Judiciary Committee or, or on the Senate calendar already who are not controversial, who could easily be voted on right now where we don't do these things and confirm right now and bring that vacancy rate down to the 70s, from to 70, in the 70s from the 90s. So it's one of those things where why wouldn't we solve this? Uh, that's not that you have to agree with me, but that's, that's sort of my answer to, to Tom Wheeler, who I know and like, yeah. <laughs> yes? Well, <clears throat> I was thinking about the two things that you just said about um, transparency and how transparency now seems to be having this effect of, um, you know, like retribution. And then I was also thinking about the role of rules and elections in general and how, you know, over time it has seemed like the, you know, the idea was to create that the, that the, the good statesmen would rise to the top. So what I'm getting from what you just said are two counterintuitive things. Like one thing that would come from the thing you said about transparency would be that, well, does that mean that now it's time to have deliberations in secret? Just like they argue in the comparative politics literature having to do with negotiations when you're in democratization. And also, is it time to consider another method of selecting decision makers such as lotteries? Well, <laughs> did, did, first of all, did everyone hear that incredibly difficult question? <laughs> all right, good, good. Uh, you know, I've struggled with this, actually. Uh, I struggle with this when I wrote this. I struggle with this when I think about this. My view has always been the more transparency, the better. That's certainly a value that Senator Leahy has been a champion of his whole career, and I worked for him on a lot of those issues. And it, the, the history is that transparency yields less corruption. I, I do think we may be entering a period where we need to consider what are the effects of the Sunshine Laws that made all of these things public, and not just C-SPAN cameras when you're having the official debate, but literally a camera on a phone following you around and capturing your every utterance. How can you have any scope of privacy? I frankly think it's a maddening time to be a, a public official. I wonder why anybody would do it. I, I think it's very difficult. So I'm not trying to like say these are terrible people. I actually think there are people who are alive and doing this in a terrible time. Uh, it may be that we have to start considering some things like that, like more of a negotiation posture. Uh, and I don't know what the check and balance is to assure accountability, but I, I do think that's something worth thinking about. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a believer in our election system. I'd rather improve it than lottery. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it would yield better results. I, I tend to think that, that it is worth, it, it, I'd rather have people pay more attention to elections and be more involved in elections, see where that takes us before we think about throwing the whole thing out. Oh, let me clarify why I asked yeah. that, because it might be that there is in, in the same as the transparency reversal, it could be that the system that we thought created good leaders is actually creating um, bad statesmen, whereas it might be the case that a different system would, would allow well, the certainly, average person to be we, we certainly seem to be in a period where uh, it is rewarding to be a demagogue, right. and that's troubling. I, I don't know whether what the easy fix is, but, but we got to get away from rewarding that. Yes? Um, so regarding the decision made today, in your opinion, will the decision made today make it more difficult for democracy to continue to flourish? Because it seems to me that the unrestricted campaign spending could cause elected officials to be even more tied down by individual donors um, and the certain individuals and constituents that are able to influence yeah. in that way because they have those resources rather than making the decisions that oh. are maybe in the general welfare of the nation. Oh, I, I d definitely agree with you said. The, the question was today's decision, which was the McCutcheon case I talked about, will it make democracy less responsive and make uh, people more responsive to donors rather than the, than the is that is the nature of your question? I'm, I'm just repeating it so everybody can hear. I absolutely think that's a problem. I mean, let, let's put the problem this way, and I, I used a version of this example in the class earlier today, so if you were there, just pretend this is all new. But you know, I've got a microphone right now. All right, you don't. So maybe, maybe I paid, came in, and, and, and there's a chance I could either speak for free 
at the regular volume, speak for $10 for the microphone. Well, I have $10 and you don't. I took the microphone, but you know what? Everybody can listen to me. Try to talk over me. You know, I just paid for more democracy than you've got. All right. Is that First Amendment? Is that fair? I, I think that that's troubling, and I think that there is a really, now, there's a tension point. Like everything, like I just said, it's not easy, because the First Amendment is, our, is so valuable and needs to be so powerful and so protective. I don't believe in setting strict limits on it, but I do believe that it's a balance. I think that your right to free speech is also worth as much as mine, and I think your right to hear and to listen and to hear different voices is very powerful and important, too. And I think that's, that, that megaphone can drown it out, can drown it out. Were there other... Uh, in the back. Uh, over the past few years, it's been, I've, I've been discouraged by hearing major news networks, uh, Fox, uh, CNN, MSNBC, uh, say the Senate uh, defeated a bill 59 to 41, or the Senate failed to pass a bill 58 to 42. Uh, it seems to me that the, the present rules, basic, and, and there's been no filibuster going on. Uh, it seems to me that the present rules basically uh, uh, prevent the the, uh, ad, the uh, opponents of the bill uh, from suffering the, the strain and the shame that and the public exposure that uh, they would get if they were actually forced to do the public. Well, you know, I'm really heartened that we're actually getting this level of questions here because I think these are really the right questions. You, you, what you're, what has happened is. Uh, as a means of moving the Senate forward in a time when everything is going to be filibustered, the leaders sort of agree on a 60 vote threshold for, for laws. And it sort of takes all the burden and the onus of that filibuster totally off the table. Instead of having to stand there like Mr. Smith goes to Washington and get tired and stand on the floor and argue uh, and, and have that heroic thing, it's just agreed, it's baked in. And nobody has to stick around. Nobody, there's like two people on the floor. Nobody has to bear the onus of, of objecting and blocking. And that 60 vote threshold has made it too easy for a minority to painlessly uh, uh, draw blood. And you're right, 59 votes and you couldn't pass the thing? Yeah, in some instances, maybe that's okay. But in this instance, and with that being the regular order, it's really problematic. It's, it's certainly counter-democratic. And a lot of good proposals out there that are worth thinking about, about how to roll that back, how to, how to promote an active filibuster. One of the proposals is that, that, that it, the funny thing about cloture votes, that vote to end a filibuster where you need 60, is it requires 60 yay votes. So one of the things we've talked about inverting that, to require the people who want to continue the filibuster to marshal 41 no votes and keep them on the floor. That would put the onus and ruin the weekends of all those people that wanted to keep uh, uh, black center for voting instead of putting the onus on those that were ready to vote to, to stay there. And I, I think that's something that is worth considering and, and may be part of the process. Uh, one more note on that. You know, the process that the majority leader used to get rid of the filibuster on judicial nominations, which was just a change in Senate rules, is theoretically available now and, and is something that I am sure future majority leaders will consider whenever they want to pass something in the Senate and don't have 60 votes to do it. I would suspect we're going to see a lot of changes in, in the near future. Did you, Uncle Jimmy, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna embarrass you by, yeah. All right. I packed the crowd, it's great. I'm gonna embarrass people. Jeremy, if for many, many years, the, the theory was that Supreme Court justices who were nominated and were to the extreme one way or the other, moderated generally their behavior when they got on the Supreme Court, you will lack the best example. This seems not to be the fact anymore. Judges appointed the Supreme Court, in fact, get more extreme as they, as their uh, longevity increases. Is that perception true? And if so, why? Um, okay, so the question was, uh, traditionally Supreme Court justices, while extreme at nomination, have moderated their views over time, and, and certainly on the court, we seem to be going away from that, where if anything, they get more extreme on the court. I, I think it's in part a process of the nomination process, which I was a part of, which does not reward a full airing of views, it rewards you know, sort of more narrowly catering how you talk about your views so, so that you don't have that full reveal. Um, you know, I, I think of uh, the, that every nominee comes before the Senate Judiciary Committee and swears homage to the precedent and I'll follow the precedent, I'll apply it fairly, I will never deviate from it. And then they get on the Supreme Court and of course instantly, poof, gone. They'll do what they want. Um, I think the Citizens United case and McCutcheon case did away with 100 years of precedent in, in certain respects. The Voting Rights Act case did away with many years of precedent, even though 
the justice who voted that way at all pledged adherence to, to the precedent. Now, I don't know. It's, I certainly agree with you that it is true. I agree with you that it is true. I don't know fully why it is true. Um, you know, it's clear that, that Clarence Thomas has not grown less conservative since being on the court. And, and, and I, I think that Justice Scalia, who has always been sort of bombastic and, and interesting and iconoclastic, has, if anything, gone further down that road as his career has gone on. And the, the Chief Justice, who you know, I think many hoped would be sort of more narrow and constrained, ha has in some ways been narrow and constrained, but clearly has, has moved, tried to move the court in, in directions. I don't know if that's also a product of the same modern media universe. This is one of those cases where I'm going to contradict myself totally. I think we need more transparency in the Supreme Court. I also think that it is crazy that um, we have these serious arguments uh, and serious discussions and we can't see what is happening in the court that they don't have streaming video. Uh, you can watch streaming video of this lecture I am giving. But you can't watch the Supreme Court argue these critical things. And you can't even get a same day audio or transcript. It, it really is maddening. I think, we, I think maybe a little more understanding of that process, uh, not less. And the last thing I'll say about that is I have long favored putting more non-judges on the Supreme Court. Uh, the professionalization of, of the judiciary has become a, a real trend where it didn't used to be the case that all of the judges on the Supreme Court, save Elena Kagan, were previously circuit court judges before they were elevated to the Supreme Court. It gives a sort of way that they write opinions and think about opinions that I think is not tied enough to the real world impact of those decisions. That's what happened in McCutcheon today. I think anybody who's lived the political process knows about the impact of money on the process. And, and, and so more justices that, that maybe come from different backgrounds could help soften that and bring a dose of reality uh, to what the court is deciding. Time for maybe one more question. Okay, yeah, why don't you pick? Since I'm going to make you the heavy. <laughs> I wonder if you just comment on the fact that the framers of the Constitution thought that more gridlock was better because, you know, the more we can delay legislation, the more we can maybe dam up the, the oppression of the people by the legislature. Um, you know, that's, that's a, again, I really, the quality of these questions is, is incredible. Yeah, I, I think it was, it was either Jefferson or Washington who called the Senate the saucer that cools the the drink or the tea or the coffee. Anyway, cooling saucer. That, that's, the, that's how it's planned. It, it's planned to be less responsive to the Democratic will, less easy to get things done than the House. A majority rules House, elected every two years, elected by these narrow districts, is going to be very responsive to, to whatever the political will is. And the Senate is buffered from that. The president's buffered from that in a different way. They set up electors. And frankly, the Senate wasn't even directly elected until the 20th century. Before that, state legislatures sent the senators uh, to the Senate. So really, these were not representatives of the people, they were representatives of the state. Uh, and, and, and it comes back to my examples. I mean, you could certainly find lots of examples where maybe bad things were averted because the Senate wasn't able to act, wasn't able to act quickly, forced compromise. Uh, and we were talking earlier today about the role of filibusters in encouraging compromise and broad coalitions. And theoretically, that works great. I think what we're seeing in reality is the invitation to obstructing across the board is turning it from a cooling saucer into just a, a, a body that isn't working uh, and isn't, isn't reflective even of a buffered democratic will. So it, it's not that it, it wasn't designed to slow things down. I think it wasn't designed to totally uh, screw things up. I, maybe that's a dissatisfying last answer, but, but I, I think it's a good question, something we, we need to think about how to maybe just ratchet it back a little bit. All right. Well, thank you.